Hey, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be in Austin. This is my first time. Having a great time. Uh, so I'm Andrew, Andrew Lewis. Um, pay attention here. My name is Andrew. Uh, if you notice carefully, I'm not wearing a badge. Uh, and something uh, happened here. Uh, there's an identity th thief somewhere in here. Uh, <laughs> I think my name is pretty common, and someone was like, oh, Andrew. Uh, nobody will notice that one gone. Uh, so look around you. If there's someone wearing an Andrew badge, uh, and they're not an Andrew, let me know. Because uh, <laughs> um, I really want one of these badges. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a personal project I've been working on for the last little while. Uh, but before I get into it, uh, I'm going to talk about history. Uh, so we don't hear too much about history at tech conferences usually. I love history, and I find all kinds of excuses to tell it to people. So uh, we're going to start in the 1930s. Uh, and it, it, it start, it, uh, it's about this person, Vannevar Bush. Uh, so he was a cool scientist, engineer. Uh, he worked at MIT in the 30s. Uh, and he built some of the first analog computers. These were giant mechanical computers that mostly did calculus. Uh, this was a hard problem. Uh, it took a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of work, and he automated it with mechanical systems. Uh, this is an example of one of them. Uh, so the operator on the right is actually tracing the curve, uh, and, the, and then the integral is calculated mechanically. So they're really cool devices. Um, so uh, he got pressed into management, as a lot of uh, you know, what happens to engineers. Uh, and then in the 1940s, something big happened that kind of uh, reshaped a lot of what, how science and universities worked, and that was World War II. So everybody got mobilized, everybody had to play a part in the war. Um, and with the war came this explosion in information. So there was these new bureaucracies, new offices, new information was just like flowing out of these new functions. Um, and new paper was coming out, new reports, new science. Um, and these are just some of the pictures that really visualized how much information was being created. And Vannevar Bush's job during the war was to, uh, was to distill this all down, all the research that was being done, and give recommendations to the president, uh, and, and, and really understand what was happening in research and, and make recommendations. Uh, so he was just flooded with information and, and new things to digest. Um, and he said, we're being buried under our own product. So science had created all these ways of, of creating information and, and outputting it, and, but we really didn't have tools to make sense of it or to uh, stay on top of information overload. Um, so when the war wrapped up, he put his engineer hat back on, and he thought about a way to solve this. And he wrote an essay in 1945 called As We May Think. Uh, and he, uh, he, de he, he described a dream device that he wanted that would solve all these problems. Um, so uh, he called it a Memex, uh, Aaron, <laughs> a Memex. Uh, and it was a, it was a device that would, uh, would solve all these problems. Um, and this is, uh, this is what it would look like. It was a desk-sized device. Um, so it would store uh, books, records, communications, uh, photos, and then you could navigate it through uh, with, mechanical, with the mechanical uh, way, and, and you find everything you wanted in this device. Um, it had these cool add-on devices like the stylus for taking notes. Uh, it had this voice recorder where you could uh, leave voice memos into your Memex. Uh, it even had this cool clip-on camera for adding photos into your Memex. Um, but the coolest thing, and the reason we're talking about the Memex still, is he had this idea that instead of just filing things by uh, categories or alphabetical indexes, uh, it would be really cool if we could navigate our personal information uh, as a graph and really like, go by association, by what we were doing or wh where that information came through, and kind of in an associative way. So um, if, if these are uh, nodes in our Memex, we can imagine as the user navigates them, the trails uh, that the user takes through the data gets recorded, and then we can use these trails to navigate later on. So it was really forward-looking. Um, the problem with the Memex is that uh, it was never built, unfortunately. Uh, it was a conceptual device, uh, uh, and, and Vannevar Bush was busy, and he never actually got to building it. Um, so this made me really sad. I, I heard about this idea, and it made me really sad. So uh, just a little bit about me, a bit of personal background. I'm an information pack rat, so if there's a piece of information, uh, I, I try to save it. Like, that's just a rule I have in life. Um, so this is my grade five journal where I started like, writing what my days were like. Um, these are my report cards from kindergarten, which I you know, started saving. Um, I have all my movie stubs over the years. I have like a record of every movie I've been to. Um, before Google Maps uh, came out, I, I tried to track my walks through Toronto just uh, to get an idea of like, where I've been in the city. Um, I even saved all my uh, chat logs from high school uh, horrifically because like, these are really not worth saving. But I, I just wanted to obsessively uh, save them. So you can see there's really like, high level discourse here. Um, <laughs> So um, with all these services that are coming up now, uh, I'm just being inundated with, with uh, personal information that I want to save. And this is a, this is a big problem. Um, so I think there's a few solutions. Like the most obvious one, perhaps, is to talk to a therapist. <laughs> this is not what I did. Um, what I did is I used Ruby to solve the problem. So I went about building a Memex. Um, 
the, 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 the biggest problem so far has been gathering the data. So um, I, I'm trying to make it all-encompassing and, and capture everything I read or see, my browser history. Um, I have all my digital consumptions, like the photos I look at or the videos I watch or music and podcasts. Um, all my location history from my phone and my messaging and social interactions from Slack, email. Um, and then there's a lot of like soft data, like journaling or notes that I take or uh, annotations. Um, and I've, I've wrote importers or scrapers for all these services, and I put them all into one place. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of a demo now. Uh, this is the part that can go disastrously wrong for me, so everybody just do a little quick prayer, and hopefully it will it'll work. Is that, is that readable for people? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so what? What we're looking at is, uh, is just like the main interface. What we have is a query for everything I've looked at on YouTube. Um, and I can, I can search it uh, by Ruby. So this is now every uh, video uh, on YouTube that I've looked at that is about Ruby. Um, and I can you know, change the style, the way it's displayed. Um, I can also do a different query, something like this, provider GitHub, um, verb liked. So this is a narrow query for every repository on GitHub that I've liked. Um, and uh, everything's stored as a graph, like inspired by the original Memex. So I can turn on this graph view and just to show you kind of how everything's organized. So in the middle here is me, because it's kind of from my personal perspective. Uh, this is a repository, uh, and these are the tags. And you can get a, get a sense of how um, I can navigate through this personal history with the graph. So um, for instance, I could do um, involved about Electron. So what I'm doing here is doing a query for everything tagged Electron that I've liked on, uh, on GitHub. Um, and the query gets updated. So it's pretty powerful. I can navigate my personal history this way. Um, also, as I mentioned, I have my uh, traveling history from my phone. Um, did anybody fly in last night to Austin? Uh, what, what time? There was, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, thunder yesterday. And uh, if I turn on my, my history of, of traveling, you can kind of see what happened. We flew from Toronto to Houston, and uh, in Houston for a layover, uh, our pilot was going west to Austin, and then he saw the thunderstorms, and he was like, nope, not today, Satan. And he turned around <laughs> and went back to Houston, and that's why I'm really tired today, because uh, you know, we had to wait, wait out the thunderstorms, uh, but we got here, after all. Um, so it's pretty cool. I have, a cool I, have a, I have a pretty full record of everywhere I've been over the last uh, half, year, half, half decade. Um, so let's say uh, a couple years ago, I went to Strange Loop with a friend, uh, Max, who's up there. Uh, and uh, it was a cool, fun road trip. Along the way, we did a lot of uh, listening to podcasts and music. Um, and let's say I'm trying to remember uh, later on, like, what was that cool song that we listened to? So I can do a query um, occurred with Max. And um, I'm going to do for traveled, first of all. So this is every, all, all the times I've traveled in a car. with my friend Max. Um, so this, this shows the road trip um, that we did. Um, and let's say I want to search for something that we did along the way. Um, so I can do um, verb listened, and it occurred during um, our, our, our travel. So this is now a, a log of all the songs we listened to along the way. Uh, <laughs> and if I want to be more specific, let's say I'm trying to find a podcast that we listened to. Um, I can do something like this, so represents an episode. So this is how I, I tag a podcast. So these are all the podcasts we listen to. Um, and it's, it's a pretty fun way. Like sometimes I might not remember anything about the podcast other than the fact that we were driving through a particular part of the States when it happened. So um, I just have a lot of options for finding my personal history. Um, when we got to Strange Loop, um, I'm listening to talks, um, and I'm like taking notes or looking up things. Um, and I can do something like this where I, where I look up on my browser history, and it, it occurred within uh, the Peabody Opera... I can't spell on stage. Opera. Um, so this is all the, all the browser history that took place within uh, within the conference center. Um, and again, I can scope it down to uh, uh, like let's say I'm looking for um, repositories. Um, so these are all the repositories I, I looked at during a talk. And this is kind of like a good log of like what, what people are talking about, what notes I, I took, or like what I was reading um, or listening to. Um, so this is kind of useful. Um, uh, you know, we're at Keep Ruby Weird, so I want to now start going to kind of less useful stuff. Um, so um, I mean, I'll, I'll do one kind of useful one. Um, so this, is, this will be a, a search for everything involving Ruby. So like this is like browser history, it's messaging. Um, 
I can scope it down to messaging. So this is now a log of everything, every message I've sent that, um, that involves Ruby. Um, so I can graph it out. Um, this is a graph of it. Um, but I can also do these, these kind of cool correlations. So um, what we have on the screen is, uh, this is a correlation of um, how many times I've, I've messaged Ruby versus my mood in the day. So you can see, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of fuzzy, but you can see that as I send more messages about Ruby, my mood kind of goes up. Uh, it's a bit vague. Or I can also do it with stress. Um, this is now a query of stress in messages with Ruby, or maybe uh, productivity if I want to have a look. Um, so as we can see, the more messages I send about Ruby in the day, the more productive I am. Um, and you know, it's kind of uh, useful maybe to learn about myself this way. Um, um, I can also do something uh, like this. I track my drinking, so I can check um, uh, my, my coffee versus uh, product, my productivity when I drink coffee. Uh, and, you know, it kind of gives a vague sense of the more coffee I drink, uh, the more productive I am. Um, I can also graph it in different ways. So let's turn on, this is like every coffee I've had. Um, but I can also graph it by hour of the day uh, with predictable results. So I have, this is, uh, this is 9 a.m. So you can see I have my 9 a.m. coffee. Uh, I can change it to beer. So you can see my evening beers. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, beer before liquor and everyone's sicker, I think is how it goes. Uh, you can see as the night goes on, sometimes I switch to liquor. Uh, <laughs> I also track my eating. Um, so this is uh, now all the burritos I've had. Um, you can see when I, when I have them. <laughs> Um, so now let's kind of maybe try to make it a little bit more useful. But let's say, let's say I was reading a book and I'm trying to find a quote from that book that I was reading uh, while I was eating a burrito. And I really don't remember anything. I don't even remember the book it was. I don't remember what it was about. But I just remember I was eating a burrito while I was doing it. So I can turn on the map view. And uh, OK, I, I remember I might have been in Toronto. Um, so um, um, I'm just going to search for burritos eaten near Toronto. Um, so these are all the burritos I've had, and I can turn on my burrito heat map here. And, <laughs> and um, as I as I scroll through my uh, burrito heat map, uh, I, I'm just trying to get a sense of like where where I eat these burritos, and maybe uh, maybe one of them will come and pop into my head about like that time I was eating and reading. Uh, so one pops up over here. Uh, let's have a look. Um, so I can zoom in, have a look at it, and see what else I was doing at the time. So um, here I was. Uh, it was a you know 20 degrees Celsius day. I was in a park and I was reading a book. So that's great. That's what I was looking for. And then I can go in and see like what else I was doing. I you know I had the photos here. I have the quotes that I saved from the book, which is what I, what I was looking for. My burrito. You know other things I did. So um, it's a bit contrived. This doesn't happen. You know it doesn't happen too often. But when it when it does, when I do have something I'm trying to find that's a bit esoteric, I have a lot of different ways of uh, of, of finding it. Um, so yeah, that's that's the personal project. Uh, quick quick demo of it. Uh, and it worked, so I'm happy about that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to go over some of the technical specs. Uh, I'll, it's a bit heavy now. Uh, just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> if you want to hear about the technical details, you can go to RubyConf next week, where I'll be doing maybe a slightly uh, less weird version of this talk. Um, or you can talk to me after. I love talking about this stuff. Um, but right now, I want to talk about something else. Uh, does anybody recognize this? What, uh, what kind of proof is this? Just someone yell it out. It's a delta epsilon proof. Um, so I was, a, I was a new computer science student uh, many years ago, and I, I was doing these math classes, and, and, it, and these delta epsilon proofs were just kicking my ass. Like, I was really depressed about it. I thought I shouldn't be in computer science. I was pretty close to dropping out. Uh, I really wanted to switch to history and just like never touch computers again. So um, you know, these, these are just some records I dug up from the past that kind of like captures like my feelings around the same time. This is like me just asking a friend, um, can I double major in history and philosophy of science? Like this is where my brain was at. Um, but around this time, I started hearing about Ruby on Rails. So this is a chat log from 2005 where I'm talking to my friend Andre about it. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, I got to check out this cool Ruby on Rails. Uh, and this was like. This was a big deal for me. Like I discovered Ruby on Rails, and like programming became fun again, and it had a big impact on me. Um, you know, it was so cool. There was like so many things that were happening around this time. Um, you know, really cool ideas, really like really good community, uh, and I think Ruby on Ruby uh, really kind of like brought me back into tech and really gave me the joy. And part of it was just the weird projects that were in the Ruby community and like the the culture and like the people who were not in it just for the technical aspects. Um, so I just want to share that about about my about my personal history. So. Uh, you know, keep Ruby weird to me is very personal, and it like, kind of kept me in this industry, and I've had a good time. So I think to bring it back to the original Memex history, um, 
the Memex was weird too. Like there was a lot that was weird about it. You might have guessed this when uh, you saw the, the Cyclops camera. Uh, this is like a weird project. Um, but there was a lot of other reasons that it was weird. First of all, its form factor was strange. So computers in the 1930s looked like this. This was a computer. And if you're, if you're squinting, trying to look at the little de desk size device, that's not the computer. The computer is uh, the room of people collectively. It's called a computer. Uh, if you don't believe me, here's a label. So it's the computing section. Um, so computers were big. They were either uh, people or they were room-sized devices. Um, this is a hard drive from the 1950s. Computers were really big. Even you know, later on, we have mainframes that were room-sized. Um, the Memex, on the other hand, was this desk size, like one user personal device. Like it was small, it would, it would fit at your desk, and it was really uh, for one person. And this was strange. Uh, this is like someone made a, a mock-up, uh, a, a real cabinet, you know, roughly giving the shape and size of, of what, a, what a real Memex would have looked like. Um, it was weird for other reasons, too. Uh, it was weird for the problem it solved. Um, this was uh, Bletchley Park, and it was solving Nazi codes, like computers were, you know, for really hard, important problems. Uh, this was uh, being used to make ballistic calculations for the war. Uh, this is the census, uh, the UNIVAC being used for the census. So computers were used for these really hard, important problems. Um, the Memex, on the other hand, was just for, uh, you know, helping people understand their history and, and their uh, personal knowledge. Um, the Memex was weird for other reasons, uh, for the technologies it used or didn't. So if you think the Memex was, you know, kind of a forward-looking device from the 40s, uh, it actually wasn't. It was actually quite backwards-looking. Um, it was all based on microfilm, which is already a technology that was on the way out. It wasn't really the cool thing anymore. The cool thing were these things, the vacuum tubes. Um, but for Vannevar Bush, he really wanted to just work with what he knew, which was uh, old technologies from the 30s. Uh, but really, he just wanted, he was more interested in the concept than the idea rather than specific technologies. Um, and this was uh, vacuum tubes being used. Like this was already kind of like how computers were moving. And he, he, you know, he just wanted to solve his particular problem without worrying about the you know, latest and greatest. Um, and then even later on, he kind of went into a into weird territory. Thought about like using crystals for uh, persistence layers and using mind control. And again, it was less about the specific technologies. It was more about like the idea of like what a memex should be able to do for individual users. Um, it was weird uh, for how it was published as well. So this cool, amazing piece of computer science history, uh, you'd think it was published in a big journal that uh, was read in the community. It was actually published in the Atlantic Monthly, uh, which is a general audience magazine. Uh, it was published, uh, this is it in the table of contents. Um, and you can see it was published next to some poetry, a uh, report on chips, and uh, a, a, you know, a novel called The Egg and I. I don't know what it's about, but it looks pretty good. Um, but one of the most important essays in computer science history was published alongside these uh, you know, other things. Uh, and then later on, the next version actually came out in Life magazine. Uh, and here it is in the table of contents. Um, and the essay, again, this is where all the illustrations came from. Uh, but if you look at like, what, what, surrounded, uh, what surrounded the essay, uh, you know, we have a laxative ad here. Um, so, um, you know, one of the biggest ideas was, like, just, you, you wouldn't have noticed it if you weren't paying attention. And I think, like, that's an interesting thing about it. Um, but I think, like, for, you know, th there's these, these four reasons I mentioned, but there's another big reason that I think it was weird. Um, it was uh, just one of many, like, weird side projects for Vannevar Bush. Like, he was a busy person, and he had a lot of uh, responsibilities. Um, he, was, he was in charge of what became later the NSL, the Ni National Science Foundation. Um, he was actually one of the civilian oversights for uh, the Manhattan Project. Uh, you know, he, he was a co-founder of Raytheon, and like, I don't want to talk about warmongering or whether that's good or not, but he was a busy person. And even later in life, he, uh, he had a, lo a lot of things that he tinkered on. And the Memex was just this idea he kept on coming back to, worked on it a little bit, published a little bit more about it. And he never, you know, he never completed it or really, like, uh, put it out into the world, but it still had an amazing impact on history. Um, so I think side projects are important. Uh, they're a big privilege, like, not all of us have, uh, you know, the time or, or the freedom to work on them. But I think if, if you do, um, make them weird, make them experimental. That's my takeaway. Um, so I just want to show one more thing uh, I've been working on. Uh, it's a little, uh, it's a little next version of it. Um, so what if we combine the Memex with Alexa? Um, <laughs> so I'm going to do a little demo of that. I, I call it the Memexa. <laughs> so let's go back to this, turn off the map. So um, let's do a query. So Memexa, when was the last time I was in Texas? Cool, that word. Um, so, you know, I can ask these kind of useful questions. I can also ask, like, less useful questions. Um, when did I last see Tender Love? Seven months ago. Cool. Where did I last see Tender Love? Okay, let's have a look. Yeah, that was Pittsburgh. That was, that was at RailsConf. This was pretty good. Um, find photos of Tender Love and business. Yeah. OK, 
Okay. Um, find photos of tender love and poutine. Yeah, I've got that. <laughs> you know, and for each one of these, we can kind of go in and look at the context. Like this, in this case, this was a conference in Montreal called QSIC. Uh, and you can, you know, I can use this voice interface to get back to it. It was actually a very cold day, if you remember. Um, so let's go back. Um, uh, find photos of tender love and I. Cool. Yeah, this was at RubyConf a couple years ago. Uh, <laughs> How far away from tender love am I right now? <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, obviously that last one <laughs> was fake. Uh, but I mean, the, re the rest were real and they were coming from real data that was, that was in here. <laughs> so um, just to close off, I'm gonna do, uh, you know, concluding ritual uh, that, you know, I'm Canadian. Uh, this is kind of like what we have to do. So apology number one, sorry tender love for being so creepy. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I talked to him earlier and I warned him this was coming and he was okay with it as long as he had a right to delete the data that was in the memex. So that's, that's cool. Uh, apology number two. Uh, so I was working on this on the plane yesterday. Uh, this is me working on the plane. So I just want to apologize to the person next to me who had to listen to me talking about tender love on my laptop the whole plane. <laughs> uh, and I, I wish you would understand that it was for, you know, for a good pause. Um, but seriously, where's this all going? Um, so this has been kind of like a long running personal project. I've been working on it for a long time. Um, I think there's a lot of like potential business cases in it. I'm not really worried about this. I'm really, I'm really interested in the experiment of it. Like, how far can I get with putting my life in a database? What habits change? What, what about my life is different? Like, how do I understand myself differently? Um, there's a, there's a phrase that was kind of rolling around with uh, Vannevar Bush that he talked. Um, as, as, the, as people would work on, as they would use the memex, the memex would actually mold, mold them, and vice versa. So there's almost like this symbiotic relationship. And I think my project is like an experiment in, in just seeing how far I can get. Uh, or to put it another way, uh, playful mind is the core of Ruby. And I, I like this just, you know, just to be playful and to experiment. And I, uh, this is kind of like why I'm doing it. So um, thanks a lot for listening. Uh, if you want more information, uh, send me a message or sign up for my newsletter. I do hope to open source most of this uh, sometime next year. So shoot me a message and I'd love to talk about this. Thanks. Wow. Wow. I guess I'm, I'm an American, so I don't get GDPR, but um, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, do you, do you want to do questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think we have, we have about five minutes for questions. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, I, I will start here, because you're closer. So I guess my question is a pretty obvious one. How do you enter all of this data? Like, right. Do you type it into your phone as you're going places, or do you have some kind of automatic tracking? Right, yeah, so the majority of stuff on the screen was actually automated. Like, the stuff that wasn't automated was, like, the, uh, the beer and, like, the food. Like, that wasn't, and, like, also sometimes I tag people manually. Uh, so, like, I have a little app on my phone that I, you know, it's, like, a really simple uh, command line kind of app, uh, and I enter data that way. But the majority of the rest of the stuff was, like, coming from, like, Twitter likes or browser history or... Um, like, I've automated almost all of it. Like, the travel logs are all from my phone. Um, so, yeah, like, the majority stuff. Like, I could, I could have a pretty useful version of this that wasn't, u wasn't using any of the manually entered stuff at all. So, yeah. Like, the burritos are fun for demos, but, like, you know, that's not the most important part of this project. So, yeah. Test that second. Uh, I'm not actually going to be at RubyConf, so but that's why I'm asking this now. But um, what's, uh, what do you use for speech recognition? Uh, speech it's the web it's the web speech API. Uh, it's available in, in Firefox and Chrome. It does a pretty good job. Like, yeah, I, you know, like, this actually took maybe like I don't know, two hours of work. Like, it wasn't that wasn't hard at all. Yeah. You're closer, so you win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, how important is the the graph for modeling those relationships, and and are you using a, a graph database? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, the graph is central, like, that's, like, the most important part of this, like, the idea that, um, you know, I'm trying to model the things that I've experienced, so, like, that it's, like, there's no schema for that, like, it is a graph of, like, associations in my head, so I'm using this really fancy uh, new uh, graph database called Postgres, uh, <laughs> and, and it works really well, like, I, I was actually using fancier stuff before, and, uh, you know, it's just, like, too weird, too weird, and, like, Postgres is, like, rock solid, and basically everything's running off a node and, rela node and relationship table, and, uh, the query planner is really good at like figuring out like which order to run things in. Like actually, like 
uh, Postgres has been amazing for this. It does full text search, uh, which has been really useful. So yeah, um, nothing too fancy, and it works. So, yeah. Can I give you money to use this right now? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I mean, the, the biggest problem is I don't want to host people's data, so I think I, I need to design a system that I can deploy updates and roll out stuff and like control it, but not host your data. So when I figure that stuff out, uh, let's talk. I'm thinking of doing a Kickstarter next year, so if you're interested, yeah, get my mailing list. Oops. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's not cracked. It's not cracked. <laughs> yeah. Questions. I think I think I have I have a question. How did you get all my data? <laughs> are, do, are you my Memex? <laughs> I mean, it could be. Like, it, you know, it could be like a, a service that I offer you your data. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. Any any other questions? Uh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> So what sort of uh, insights have you gotten from the data? Yeah, I don't think there's been any, you know, kind of like particular like, you know, light, lightning bolt moment of like clarity around my life. Um, you know, a lot of the correlations that I showed, like they're, they're kind of stupid and like I, I thought I would find more insight that way. Um, and I'm, I think like as I work on this project, I'm, I'm not looking for that kind of stuff. I'm, I, I think the thing that has been really useful for me is just like the ability to just search a, a term and see like all my history with it. Like if I see someone's name, I can just put it in here and see like that time they were mentioned in a newsletter 10 years ago or something like that. And like this amazing context is like just available like within like, you know, one, one second or two seconds of, of, of time. And I think that habit has really like changed the way I, I live. Like I, I, uh, I know that I can always find stuff and that's like a really powerful kind of way to live. So, yeah. I think that's enough. Thank you, Andrew. Everyone give him a round of applause, please. <laughs>